Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see everyone here. Great to see everyone online. We're just delighted everyone is here. So uh, we have a big mission uh, here at Community of Hope and a mission that has been driving this church from its very beginning days. When you leave here, you can go and see the mission. It's on the other side of the wall that I'm facing right now. And the mission is this. We believe our church exists to interest disinterested people in Jesus Christ and grow together, grow together into fully devoted followers. And so we've been about that now for 20 years. And so I'm very, very excited about the Alpha. How many of you ever heard of that before? How many of you ever heard of the name Bear Grylls? Do you know Bear Grylls, like the, the Survivor guy? Not the Survivor guy, but the Bear Grylls guy show. Uh, what? Man versus, Man versus Wild. Be quiet, Trevor. Okay. <laughs> so, like, uh, Bear Grylls became a follower of Jesus through Alpha. And uh, we are very excited about bringing this ministry to our church. It's right in the DNA, right in the heart of our church. How many of you have friends that are not yet followers of Christ? All right. I was talking to somebody before this church began, and they said, hey, we heard that you, like, when you did the foundation of the church, you put stuff in the foundation. What did you put in the foundation? And I said, well, one of the things that so many of us did back in that era is we wrote the names of people we were praying for to come to faith in Christ in this building in the foundation. So stones are laid all over the place uh, here with names on them. So this is really part of the DNA of our church. We wanted to show you this early for two reasons. Number one, we want you to begin to pray for the people that you have in your circle who are not yet followers of Jesus. And then secondly, you would invite them to Alpha. Now, if you just come because it's a cool Bible study, and it is, if you just come because there's food, because Community of Hope stands for help our people eat, okay, you're missing the point. So we want you to pray and invite folks to Alpha, and they're going to come and meet the lover of their soul like we just sang to the lover of our soul. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Praise God. All right, uh, advertisement over. All right, open your message, uh, your con connect folder, Grab your message notes. We're week three in a series right now. We're simply calling the series Chapter Two, A Future with Hope. And we're talking about the stories through the book of Acts about life change and the difference that Jesus Christ makes as a result of his resurrection. And so we're, uh, we're not only doing just sort of a historical survey where we're doing some learning about those things, but we're considering what our own lives might look like as a result of the power of Christ in the resurrection. And so we're sort of not only building a rationale, but we're taking a deep dive into some of the stories. And as we're looking at some of the stories, we're kind of juxtaposing those stories up against our own lives. And we're looking at our own lives and we're considering, okay, does, is that same kind of truth, is that same kind of power, is that same kind of understanding, is it applicational for my life too? And here's what I'm so happy to report this morning. I wanna say yes, yes, and yes. Uh, I was praying this week about this week being a big week for our church and praying this week about this series and this message. And I thought of this verse of scripture that is one of my favorites. It happens in one of the older books in the Old Testament. It's Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 28. It gives us an idea, if you will, sort of to raise a banner as we begin this morning, sort of an understanding of the character of God. Here's what the prophet, God said through the prophet, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give to you a heart of flesh. And then I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors and you'll be my people and I'll be your God. And so when we're talking about all this stuff, I want you to understand right as we sort of weigh in this morning, this is applicational. This is, under, this is important. This is something that we can apply in, uh, into our lives that makes a difference just now. Uh, if you're like me, you're always looking at faith and you're going, does it make a difference? I mean, all of us are here. We brought stuff into this room. Uh, life has a way, if you will, I think of it this way, it just sticks on us, doesn't it? And we go through circumstances and we go through scenarios, we go through situations and, and we're damaged in some way by all of that and we just start lugging all this stuff around. 
Uh, every now and again, part of my work is to counsel folks who are going to get married. And, uh, you know, uh, right now in, in our culture, one in two marriages doesn't work. It's like hovering right at about 50-50. We're not doing that great. And in fact, some studies suggest even within the church, only a marked difference. So we're not doing well about applying these truths. And I, uh, my little analogy I'll often tell couples when, when I'm counseling them is I'll say, you know what, imagine the wedding day and, um, you know, the groom, I say, you're going to be standing up in the front of the church and you're going to be there with all your best man and all your groomsmen and all of that and you're going to have all these boxes around you. And he kind of looks at me like, what? And I said, then the doors are going to open in the back and here comes the bride. Her dad is walking her in and she's toting all this luggage. And they're like going, what are you talking about? You know, and they're going, is this how you do it? I want to go to a different church, you know? <laughs> and I'll tell them, you know, that really the secret of, of moving forward in life is being able to open all the boxes, open all the bags, and make some decisions about what's working and what's not. And we take out sacred things, and we go, this is sacred. It's part of our journey. It's going with us. We take out other stuff, and we go, this is, this is the circumstances. This is the life stuff from our family that's just sticking on us. It's ugly, and I want to say it doesn't go. And really, that's an analogy, not just true right in marriage. It's an analogy of life. So we bring some stuff in here. So we're looking at these stories, and we're considering uh, the application of those stories to our own lives. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to read to you a story that happens in Acts chapter 3. And uh, here's what I want us to think about as we begin to look at it. It is the first story. It is the first recorded miracle that takes place in the church after the resurrection, okay? First recorded miracle that takes place in the church after the resurrection. And we find it in Acts chapter three, verses one through 16. I wanna read it to you. We're gonna look at this chapter two story and we're gonna apply some truths from this story to our own lives this morning. Here it is. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put uh, every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, but Peter looked straight at him as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running into the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our forefathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this, for by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him. That has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, let's kind of look at this for a moment. We have Acts chapter 1. We have the ascension. And remember that, that Jesus is now showing himself to many uh, and verifying his resurrection. And he tells the disciples in that moment, he said, wait, Terry, wait till the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. We looked at that. We get to Acts chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit fills the church. They speak with other tongues. The church is born. We have that wonderful passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2 
verses 42 through 47, frankly, that we have built our church on the principles of that church in Acts chapter two. Our partnership class is built on that passage. Then we get to Acts chapter three, and it begins with Peter and John going to the temple to pray. Now, it's interesting that here they are part of this new religion, and yet they're still observing all of the functions of their other religion. So they're being good stewards to that. We know historically the Jewish day begins at 6 a.m., ends at 6 p.m. Devout Jews uh, would observe three special hours of prayer, 9, 12, and 3. So they're going uh, to observe these, uh, these practices, and it's here that they run into the beggar. And uh, he is there uh, before the gate called Beautiful, Uh, The scripture says that he's lame from birth. It's a powerful phrase. And uh, it's kind of interesting to think about that because um, there was all this tension in that culture about how to really think about people who struggled with certain conditions. Now, if you think about in our day, we still, in some measure, we wrestle with that. Sometimes we run into somebody and they may have some, uh, some... deficiencies, some struggles in an area, and sometimes we don't know how to respond. We don't know how to, to look at them. We don't know how to talk to them, and we, we try real hard in our own culture to overcome a lot of that, but here's what I want us to think about this morning, and it's even difficult to talk about, but in the ancient world, this was so much harsher, and I just want us to get a picture of this, so it's kind of hard to talk about, but it says this. Um, in the ancient world, Greeks would regularly do away with children with physical limitations. Aristotle once wrote in his own journals, he said, let there be a law that no challenged child physically should be raised. In the fifth century in Rome, BC, there was actually a law in the books about doing away with, and the word was exterminating those that struggled with any physical challenge. I mean, I just want us to think about that. But what I want us to think about too, and yet in Israel, there was this whole different stigma. There was an erroneous yet common assumption that if people were suffering physically, they had somehow brought it on themselves. Many of us might remember the story of the blind man with the, when Jesus was in, early in his ministry and he was teaching the disciples. And we might remember there's this moment when he's teaching the disciples and he heals a blind man, but before he heals them, they come upon the blind man and one of the disciples asks him, we may remember. Remember the disciple said, Jesus, Rabbi, tell us who sinned, his parents or him? There's, there's the idea right there. And so, so they, they, come across, they come across this beggar and the beggar is probably there and he's, he's asking for money. He's begging for alms, and he's asking for what he thinks he wants, and he's about from John to get a whole lot more than he bargained for. I think it's interesting to think about this. The guy knew exactly where, really, to come and to, and to beg for money because um, he's just outside the temple gate. And the idea that thinking was that, you know, these are religious people coming to observe religious practices. And so most likely in that zone, they're gonna be a little bit more compassionate. And so, you know, probably as a result of that, they're gonna get more money. He's gonna get more money because they're in tune with some sort of religious practice. Only something way greater happens. Which leads me to the first observation I want us to talk about. Because a lot of us are here this morning and a lot of us are listening online and here's what we're navigating. We're navigating parts of our own journey that we want to experience a chapter two. We've got a part of our story that we want to leave behind. We've got something breaking in our lives that we wish was not a part of our life, but it is a part of our life. And what we're trying to figure out right now is how do we navigate that? If that's true, how do we navigate it? And when I burrow into this story and I begin to look at the observations and consider its application for my own life, I think of this, first of all, if we're ever gonna experience a chapter two moment in our lives, we're gonna have to deal, first of all, with what we know about ourselves. What we know about ourselves. 
And it happens actually in uh, Acts chapter three, verse two. Look at what it says. It says, now a man who was, here's the phrase, lame from birth. Say that with me, lame, lame from birth. I started thinking about that when I was reading and, and Trevor and I were studying for this passage of scripture. I thought of another translation that actually translates it this way, crippled from birth. That's one translation. And I thought, you know what, really, honestly, we're all in some measure crippled from birth, right? I have a friend who says it this way, there's a nut in every family tree. <laughs> now, the problem is, some of you listening to me right now, you're the nut people are talking about right now. It's you. So there's a nut in every family tree. There's, you know, all of us. Here's, here's the thing. This guy was a beggar, and he knew it. He was crippled from birth. But when I think about it, we're all in the same category. All of us carry brokenness. All of us carry inner struggles. All of us have been stained by sin's crippling power. And there are days in all of our lives when we feel the crushing weight of it. Here's the interesting thing I think about. We're all beggars. Every one of us are here this morning. We're beggars. And if we're gonna really experience a chapter two journey in our life, we're gonna have to come to a place where we're gonna have to deal honestly with what we discover about ourselves. And we're gonna have to be willing to face it straight on. Now, it's interesting, even the, 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 the people, I don't even wanna pick on the beggar. I, I'm thinking about these other guys too. Here's Peter and John, they're part, of, they're part of the whole thing. I wonder if they're looking at the beggar thinking, I remember what it's like to be a beggar. We don't know a lot about John, uh, John is maybe the disciple we know the least about. John, we, we know he was uh, sometimes referred to as the beloved disciple. Some scholars think as a result of that, maybe he was Jesus' closest friend among the disciples. We know that John also historically was the only disciple that actually was not martyred for his faith. He escaped. He's the one who lived out his life. Everyone else was martyred for their faith. But I'll tell you about this. I think John knew that he was a beggar because he was a part of the way, he was a follower of Jesus. And in John's gospel, he's the one who writes the most about John the Baptist. And remember, John the Baptist was the one whose baptism was a baptism of, you can write it down, repentance. He was the one who wrote the most about that baptism of repentance. But then someone else is gonna come, John wrote, that John the Baptist said, of whom I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I think John knew he was a beggar. That's all I'm saying. You think Peter knew he was a beggar? I, I, I think Peter knew he was a beggar. He's the one who denied Jesus three times. He's the one that when uh, Jesus took him to the mountain with the other disciples, John was probably a part of that. And he was transfigured in front of them. Remembered Peter was the one who said, man, this is awesome. Love the mountain. Can we stay here forever? Remember that? And Jesus said no. And he said no. In fact, we're not, we're not going to stay here. I'm going to go down the mountain. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to sacrifice my life there. And remember, Peter said, no, you're not. And Jesus said, get behind me. What? You guys read your Bible. Good. I mean, he called out and said, you're, 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 that's, you're listening to the voice of Satan. I remember, too, the first time Jesus and Peter had an encounter. Andrew, Peter's brother, introduced Peter to Jesus, and Peter had been fishing all night. They'd caught nothing. And so the rabbi, the fisherman, the, or the rabbi, the religious person, comes walking up, and he said, how'd it go? He said, we didn't do so well. What'd you catch? Nothing. Let's go out again. Lord, it's in the morning. You don't fish in the morning. Well, let's go out anyway. I, uh, okay, so they, they push out, they get out. Jesus says, hey, cast your nets on the other side. Don't you imagine that Peter was going, oh my gosh, seriously? The religious guy knows everything, right? I've heard that before, actually. So he casts the nets into the water. What happens? catches more fish than he's ever caught. What's his first response? Jesus, would you depart from me? I'm sinful. 
And Jesus says, I'll make you a fisher of people. All I want to say this morning is that they all probably knew they were beggars. And most of us know we're beggars. And there comes a powerful moment in our lives when we have to deal with exactly what we know about ourselves. I remember a time when I was growing up, my little brother and I were down at a neighbor's house. We lived in a neighborhood that was literally carved out of an orange grove. It was beautiful. I just remember such great memories from growing up there in Tampa. And, and we were down, and, and we had come up with, a, all of the guys in the neighborhood would come up with this great idea. My friend was in the backyard. We were, some of them were swimming in the pool, and we were in the front yard. And we decided, I know what we'll do. This was my brilliant idea. I said, let's pick some of the oranges off the tree and throw them over the house and bombard the guys in the pool. That was my idea, wise idea. So we're doing that. We're having this oranges are flying everywhere. My little brother says, I want to participate too. I said, you're not strong enough to throw an orange over the house. He goes, yes, I am. He picks this orange up. He throw, goes to throw it, throws it right through the family room window. And all the way home, he's kicking himself, and he's saying, oh, my gosh, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. And I'm going, yeah, you actually are stupid. Was... <laughs> and we get home and tell my dad. My dad says, you march your butt right back down to that house and tell him you're going to pay for that window out of your own allowance. And he's marching back again saying, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. And we get there, and he opened the door, and my dad had called the neighbor, and the neighbor was so kind. Bummed me out. But here I am telling him he's stupid. You know, it kind of reminds me, right? Often, right, we're so good at looking at everybody else's flaws but our own. I remember a time when I was in seminary, I gave my older brother uh, advice about parenting. The only trouble was I wasn't married and didn't have any kids. <laughs> but I was an expert. Right? Right? So there comes a moment when we have to deal with what we know about ourselves. And here's what we know about ourselves. We're all beggars. And it's interesting. Um, one of my favorite books is a book entitled Practicing Greatness by Reggie McNeil. And he writes this. He says, if the path to self-awareness sounds like it's long and arduous, full of insights you may be thinking you'd rather not have to face, keep in mind that it's well worth the effort because there is a tremendous price to be paid for the failure to work on and gain our own self-awareness. It's not automatic. It can't be assumed. But the payoffs for developing the discipline will be tremendous in the long run. Now, here's another observation. I think once we deal with what we know about ourselves, it leads to another point, which is simply this. Where do you go with what you know? Where do you go with what you know? I mean, you're going to discover some stuff, right? What are you going to do with what you discover? I find it interesting that this story helps us out. Look at what happened to the guy. First of all, he went to the gate called Beautiful. That's where he went. He went there every day. Historians believe actually that was the eastern gate into the temple that divided the court of Gentiles from the court of women. It was made of bronze, and it literally was beautiful. And as a result of that, it's interesting to think about that uh, while he was struggling with his condition, while he was struggling with the idea that he was a beggar, he situated himself just on the outside of God's presence, on the outside of the gate. And it's kind of interesting to consider that that's oftentimes what we do. Sometimes we look at the world's solutions that seem so great. They're enticing. They're all dressed up. They're even beautiful. But they're not close enough. And that's what I want you to think about this morning. It's in the neighborhood. It's just not close enough. And, and the other thing is kind of interesting to me. It says people carried him there. I mean, can I, just, can I just challenge everybody in the room and those listening online? The world is filled with people that will tell you what you want to hear and help you do what 
you want to do, even if at the end of the day, it's exactly all the wrong advice. He got carried there over and over and over again. After all, we're beggars. We keep doing little things, engaging in little activities that appear like we're actually really doing something. But at the end of the day, all the change that we've collected, not really helpful. And here's what I want everybody to understand. Small change equals small change. Right? If we're going to have a chapter two story, we're going to have to consider the deeper work of change and a different strategy altogether than what we may have been considering now for quite some time. And this is what I love about the story. It's in there. It's in there. So, so when I think about this, it's, it's actually even not what we discover about ourselves, it's, it's not even necessarily what you do with what you know. It's, it, it's actually who you go to. And really what I love about this, first of all, is this. I, I kind of think of this phrase. Who better really to invite you in than the one who knows where you've been? Right? I mean, there's Peter. I love this story. Acts chapter three, verses four through six. This is what it says. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And again, I, I think Peter, Peter gets it. Who better to invite someone in than to someone who knows where you've been, right? I mean, remember when Peter denied the Lord? He said, Lord, I, I won't deny, Jesus said, before the evening's out three times, Peter. And the third time when the rooster crowed, what did Peter do? It says he went outside outside and he wept bitterly if we don't consider deep change here's what i want everybody to know it'll always drag you and entice you away from the power and presence of christ and part of the christian experience is that we step in not away and it's right there in the story for us to understand. And I think Jesus is the same way. Jesus, who better to invite you in than one who knows where you've been? Isaiah chapter 53a says this, Jesus himself was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. My favorite translation says this, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I mean, Jesus gets it. He knows. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this. We don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Let me read that again. We don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Let me read it again so you get it. We don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Praise God, someone's alive. We have one who's tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. Look at this powerful verse. So then let us approach God's throne with grace and confidence then so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know what this is right here? This is a collection of beggars. One beggar telling another beggar where we find bread. Acts 3.16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. 
For it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. That's not small change. That's a transfer of your life from your power, your strength, your wisdom to Jesus' power, Jesus' strength, Jesus' wisdom. The one who knows where you've been, who invites you in. For on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and inviting them in, he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And after supper, he took a common cup, and after he had given thanks to the Father, he turned to the disciples, and he said, take this cup. This cup represents my blood that is shed for you and for the sins of the world. In fact, whenever you eat bread in this fashion or drink from a cup like this, let it be a reminder that Jesus says, I will be the one full final sacrifice for all the sins of the world. I don't know any more dramatic way to invite you in than this. This morning, we're going to be giving you an opportunity to prepare your heart. The Bible says we take a meal like this in reverence. We think about our own brokenness and where we need to have some real moments about ourselves, and we navigate toward not what and where, but who. We'll receive this morning by intinction, which means you'll be dipping a piece of the bread into the cup that you're given. You'll be coming from your seats from the right, my right, my right, which would be your left is where you're coming from. Now we're doing a little different because the seats are different. So everybody in these sections will be coming all the way up here. You will be coming all the way up here. We have a section for here and for here. And then once you have been served, those who are in the middle will move over and finish serving to the back. And we have a gluten-free station back there. Let's pray. God, give us the courage this morning not to settle for small change when what we need is way deeper and broader. We need a systemic transplant of our heart. But you have told us that you'll provide it and have paid for it through the blood of Christ. So we come with thankful hearts in Jesus' name.